Hello, everyone. We're here today with Representative Don Beyer to talk about artificial intelligence. Congressman, thank you so much for joining us today. It's my, my great pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. So uh, we're really excited to talk to you about this. Uh, as you kind of have a unique perspective, you might be the only person in Congress who uh, both uh, serves uh, on the caucus for artificial intelligence and is also getting their master's degree in uh, machine learning at the same time. So as a student of computer science and someone who passes legislation on computer science, what kind of a unique perspective has it given you on the pluses and the potential challenges of AI? It's been um, really fun, although there is you know, a, a disconnect because I'm still, oh, I feel like, you know, a, a rookie when it comes to really understanding machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm on my fifth course right now. I've got another nine to go probably um, before getting that degree. In the meantime, what it's done though is thrust me into the middle of the federal conversation on policy. And so uh, I probably do more reading on all the different ideas about how you manage AI, what the upsides and the downsides are than actually writing computer programs. Although the computer programs are pretty much fun, but I'm surrounded by people a third or a quarter of my age. <laughs> AI technology has enabled the creation of highly convincing fake videos and news articles. Misinformation online is already a problem, especially on social media, which has increasingly become a major news source for a lot of Americans. Now, AI might add a new layer to the creation of even more sophisticated misinformation. How can this proactively be addressed before the technology becomes even more widespread? Yeah, it's a very hard question because we've had misinformation around for a long time. Uh, we, you don't have to go too far to, to see newspapers or even TV stations um, that give you t a totally incorrect view of the world, um, often depending on where you sit. Uh, and and the, the rise of deep fakes has got lots of people very concerned. Um, I think we start with education. Um, there's I've got a bill in Congress modeling what they do in Finland, where from kindergarten through 12th grade, they're teaching people to be skeptical about the information sources that they have, you know, testing them, looking for secondary and tertiary confirm, you know, confirming um, of, of what they read. Um, and I think we're just going to have to end up being skeptical much, much more in our world. Um, trusted sources are going to be very, very much more important. There are things like watermarks, um, but I don't know anybody that really thinks that there's a, an, an instant technological solution to things like deep fakes. Um, well, one of the things that we're trying to do right now is disclosures when AI is used. But if the disclosure doesn't show up, maybe you think, well, this is the real thing. How do you deal with deep fakes and bullying? I just heard a lot about that in terms of, you know, it's one thing to have a deep fake for a presidential election. It's another for a kid in high school in Tecumseh who has no means to combat it. Is there a watermarking that can be used to help with that? I don't I don't think so. I mean, it's depending on, on the sources. You may, as we have tried to do with social media, is clean up the really evil uses of it, you know, throwing them off, making it inaccessible. Um, but there will always be other sources. In this that case, the, the dark web. You think bullying is one, but also think, um, you know, the sex shaming stuff, which you could do with deep fakes there. Um, really yeah. bad things. But so uh, overall, it's really tough to control the technology. Um, but I mean, many people argue that we already have the criminal laws in place um, to, to, to punish these things. Um, we'll, we'll wait and see whether that's true or not. But certainly some of these things are just going to have to be illegal and have to be punished by, by law enforcement or other agencies. Well, as, uh, as you're probably aware, there's a two strikes going on right now in the entertainment industry, yeah. the Screen Actors Guild, which Chris and I are members of, on behalf of the actors, the Writers Guild on behalf of the writers, are striking on a bunch of different issues. One of the big ones is AI. For the actors, it's a little more straightforward. There's a, a, a negotiation on making sure that you cannot use my image in any way that I don't agree to when I agree for you to have it. For the writers, it becomes about intellectual property, both when you get something out of a chatbot and hand it to a writer who owns that if it generates from a chatbot, but more importantly almost, how did that information get into that 
chat GPT. It came from somewhere, right? These things don't have brains. They don't make up information. Sarah Silverman has a lawsuit right now, as well as a few other writers. New York Times is trying to address this in terms of stopping people to take their own proprietary intellectual property and feed it into a chat bot that then comes out other side and is used without their permission. How do we make it so people don't lose the rights to their own intellectual property? We're going to probably end up with a whole new body of intellectual property law just around this. I know Getty Images, for example, is suing、uh, one of the AI companies for using his images to train the software、uh, without permission.、Um, I talked to folks like Charlie Rivkin, the head of the Motion Picture Association of America. That's on the other side. The studios are terrified about what they will. What AI can do with the, their content, their creativity, you know, the work that you guys do—not just your own image, but the entire film—and、um, then you think about it with music too. It's not not a leap. We're seeing it already, where you you plug in, you know, a hundred or so many songs, and you can generate songs that sound exactly like them,、um, with lyrics that are built on the old lyrics.、Um, so being able, I think. We will look right away in the short run at how these cases turn up, but if if the intellectual property is not respected and corrected、uh, in the courts right now, we're going to need new legislation at the federal level and almost certainly at the international level to protect to protect privacy and to protect intellectual property. Sure. It's just so worrying when you think about everything all at once. Not not to. Make light of this next question because this is another major concern. Job displacement is another big concern for workers. According to a CNBC study, a fourth of workers are worried that AI will take their jobs、uh, or make their work obsolete. What do you say to those people worried about losing their jobs to AI, and how might automation affect the workforce? Well, I think it's a very fair question. In fact, I had a really interesting meeting recently with a small group in Virginia who's putting together. What they call the taxonomy of the downsides of artificial intelligence. You know, let's look at what are the things that we're afraid of, from the big existential threats to something that's very obvious, like like job elimination. You know, the、uh, Mark Andreessen, among others, has written about how every technological breakthrough, going back to fire in the wheel, has led to job displacement and people's fears about. You know, no longer needing them for for what they did before,、uh, and yet every single one has ended up creating many more jobs, you know, down the line. You know, we have eight billion people on the planet right now. In the United States, we have ten million unfilled jobs we can't find people for,、um, but they will be different jobs, and people will end up being at least creatively displaced in the short run, or maybe even the middle run. Um, it, I think it's going to be a time, a dangerous time in history, where all of us are going to have to stay on the balls of our feet when it comes to our, our future work, and can't we're not going to be able to take anything for granted. One of the, the positive sides that few people talk about is、um, AI may create enough additional wealth that we don't need to work 45 or 50 hours a week. We've got legislation pending for Congress on a, a 32-hour work week. I mean, John Maynard Keynes said, "If progress keeps going the way it is, someday we can all work only 15 hours a week, you know, a lot more time for our families, for golf, for、uh, fishing, whatever."、Um, but you're right. In the short run, if, if I'm a copy editor or maybe even a screenwriter,、uh, I'm going to be terrified that there are going to be need many fewer of me that, than there are right now. You mentioned、uh, digital privacy. Earlier, I know in ASP we we went to great lengths at the beginning to make sure the technology that we communicated on was a safe space. We knew we'd be talking to elected officials. We have a lot of students from across the country that join us, and we wanted, to the best of our abilities, to make it so that no one's experience or the data off of these experiences could be co-opted and used for a purpose that we weren't aware of. Zoom just now got accused. And is now under fire for doing just that, being in an environment like this and allowing people to mine the data or allow themselves to mine the data of people having conversations to grow their corporate wants. First of all, how does that happen? How is data off of an exchange like this used, and 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 how is it collected in the first place? Yeah, and, and we don't we don't have to go back too far. I remember forty years ago, in in the family automobile business. We are constantly looking for the data. You know, who could afford to buy a new Volvo? Who could afford to buy a new Land Rover? And then, with the, with the, ex- 
the rise of social media, obviously, we fed um, unbelievable amounts of data into the social media companies that, that are then used for us. You know, we, my wife and I will we'll talk in the kitchen and all of a sudden, you know, somebody's listening on the kitchen, you know, Alexa, and it shows up on our computer 10 minutes later. Um, so it's fascinating that the, the big companies in America, you know, the, the Fortune 2000, are paying more attention to privacy concerns even than to artificial intelligence governance concerns. That it has become such an important part, and even really good in a good way, a bipartisan concern. Democrats and Republicans equally worried about what happens when we put so much personal information into the internet. That's why the big fight over TikTok. Uh, it's not so much that we don't want China to have the money as the concerns about what happens if when the Chinese Communist Party has all this individual personal inf information on, on, you know, Chris or Don. Uh, so how do we do that? Um, once again, I think that the AI models um, are going to have to intentionally provide for uh, disclosures and promises, trustworthy promises, that the data is not being collected and not being sold and used. One of the things we haven't talked about yet is the, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, part of the Department of Commerce. They're the ones who determine how long a second is, how long a foot is, et cetera. Um, they have developed, we think, the world standards for what the, uh, the, the principles should be for the use of artificial intelligence. And among their top principles is protected privacy. Good. They gotta hurry up. Uh, in, in, a, in a 2019 US government study, many facial recognition algorithms were more likely to misidentify racial minorities than white people. According to the New York Times, all six people to date who have reportedly been falsely accused of a crime due to facial recognition have been black. In your experience studying machine learning, is AI ready to be used in the criminal justice system? Well, absolutely not at the level of policing. And, um, I've been working for six years now on banning facial recognition technology on body camps for the police for exactly that reason. You know, it's much talked about the different experiments on facial recognition and not doing well with people of color, not doing well with women. You know, it's the old garbage in, garbage out um, when it comes to, to um, scanning images. And so you, know, you can see it would be useful Oh, think London and all the street cams they have in order to recreate crime scenes, perhaps to identify potential suspects. But the notion of arresting people on the basis of facial recognition technology is absolutely not ready, which is why um, the cases that you mentioned, Chris, it's, it's very sad. People locked up sometimes for 24 hours and sometimes for two weeks for a crime they had nothing to do with, only because they looked sort of like the person. The U.S. Department of Defense and NATO have both issued ethical AI principles, but there's a real concern in the defense community about how the adversaries are developing this technology. Now, should there be international standards or an international organization that governs the safe use of AI for the purposes of national security and military engagement? And honestly, would that even be effective? Would that matter? Y yes. I, I, yeah. First of all, the answer, I think, is absolutely yes. You know, we're you know, 330 million people out of 8 billion. So we want to do the very best we can, but there's the whole rest of the world. Uh, Europe is, I want to say ahead of us, but they're, they're way out there with their uh, EU Artificial Intelligence Act, which is much more prescriptive than ours. You know, they require licensing for, for all kinds of software and, and hardware, um, you know, permission to do use different algorithms, things that we probably aren't ready yet for here, but at least they're trying really hard. And even folks, you know, in India, uh, China, um, you know, China, they're our, our big adversary. Um, yeah, you know, they can't afford to have uh, AI run loose wild. Um, you know, it, in an authoritarian regime, that definitely doesn't work. So the, the, the best hope, I think, is that as a nation, as a world, we can come together and form something like the Geneva Convention on the Use of Artificial Intelligence. From, from my standpoint, we start with the NIST uh, framework, uh, which is the one that most people in the field and certainly most businesses um, think is the, the gold standard right now and help our folks in the BRICS and other nations around the world to say, let's look at these standards, let's make them uh, universal. And, and it, it's a fair question about whether we'll work in wartime, but you know, most of the Geneva Convention, 
um, use of chemical and, and biological and things like that, gases, uh, it's, it's protected an awful lot. Not perfect, but way better than it would have been without the Geneva Convention. Last question. Back in March, more than a thousand technology leaders, including Elon Musk, urged artificial intelligence labs to pause development, citing profound risks to society and humanity. Should AI development slow down to give Congress enough time to pass regulations, or is it already too late? I think it's already too late. Uh, I also don't know how you can really ask AI to slow down when it's not just those big four companies. We think about them with ChatGPT, um, but it's also virtually um, every company of any size in the U.S. that I know of is trying to figure out um, how to use AI in a way that enhances their customer service and makes their profits better, uh, gives them a new uh, market share. Yeah, uh, it's going to show up on every one of our apps probably in the next couple of months if it isn't already. So it's the the, the genie's out of the bottle, and uh, it, it's also trying to imagine a you know, maybe you could ask the big four to slow down, um, but at the same time there are people worried that uh, they already have um, almost all of the market share, so you're you're shutting down you're shutting off competition by doing that. We don't want to give them uh, the, the the monopoly, their oligopoly, for the years to come. Uh, you know, one of the things the bills that we introduced last week is called the Create AI Act, which gives the um, data sets to average students, professors, researchers uh, to be, explore AI on their own, um, so that it's not limited to uh, OpenAI or Microsoft or Google. That y- you and I can actually begin to explore AI on our own level with data sets that are curated, that are reliable, that aren't full of garbage. Uh, just a personal curiosity, is NIST the organization that governs what, who uses the metric system, who uses inches and meters, and can we get them to agree that we can all have the yeah. same one? <laughs> the version thing is still killing me. I, there's, oh. If that's the one, can we talk to them? Well, I remember uh, uh, it was uh, Lincoln Chafee decided to run for president on converting to the metric system. It didn't work real well. <laughs> um, All right, never, yes, they do. They're the ones who decide how long. I don't want to get you out of office. That's fine. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Congressman. We really appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to having you come back and talk to us a little bit about the moon and space next time. Oh, that'd be yeah, fun. Yeah, I can't uh, wait. Too. Let's talk fusion too sometime too, because it's that artificial intelligence and fusion are the two things that will completely change life on Earth, and hopefully wow. in a very good way. Hope so. Thank you so much, Congressman. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Congressman. Have a good day.